I ask you something. Does this sound somewhat like you? You go to math or some other class and you, you, you understand the lessons and what the teacher is saying. You know, you go and do the homework, it's mostly pretty easy. Your test is next week and you feel confident, prepared. You know, the day of the test comes, bam, just like that. You remember nothing. The questions on the test are like nothing you've seen before in the homework or in class. You know, you can't attempt anything and you get a crap mark or you simply just ran out of time. Hi, my name is Hassan and today I wanted to talk about how to write a test. So 65% of the way to getting a good mark on a test is, you know, knowing the content that will be on the test. But the other 35% is knowing how to actually write a test properly. So you're probably thinking, you know, yes, you just pick up your pen and write the test, right? I mean, and yeah, you can do that. But, you know, if you do that, your results may not be as high, not even because you didn't know the content that was being tested, but um, because you just didn't know how to actually properly attempt a test. This is something so, so important. Yeah, it's something that nobody actually talks about, nor is it taught by teachers at any point. It is just something that's kind of picked up if you're lucky enough over time as you write more tests. So I want to break that ice and give some of the things that have accumulated over the time uh, in IB and hopefully help some people. So now the first question you probably have is, Hassan, what do you stand to gain from this? Why should I listen to you? Why are you doing this? Well, you know, that's a good question. You don't want to be listening to every random stranger on the internet. So, you know, I'll give, I'll give the full disclosure here. I'm making this video as part of a CAS project. CAS project is a mandatory requirement of the IB program, which I'm a part of. You know, it's our way of fulfilling the otherwise mandatory um, Ontario volunteer hours requirement. So um, I thought instead of bullshitting my way through CAS requirements, I'd make something that might actually help someone. Um, so that's my main motive behind this video. So I'm currently a year two IB program student. I'm in the IB program in Ontario. So I finished a math in the IB, which is the equivalent of um, I think MCV, MHF, and MDM combined in for Ontario. And I achieved the highest possible grade in IB, which is a seven. Uh, I have an ongoing level seven in the higher level biology. I was consistently top of my class in physics. And Almost had a seven in IV chemistry, but not quite. So with that out of the way, I'm going to talk about how to actually write a test. So I'm gonna start off with this because this is the most important. Mindset and mentality is a big thing when it comes to writing tests, yet it's often overlooked. So as such, you want your confidence levels to be as high as possible during the test and before the test. So to accomplish this, make sure your schedule, schedule is such that you're done your studying in advance of the night before the test. And so this will make you feel more confident and feel ready. Now, in the hour or so leading up to the test, you don't want to be studying. Do not study. Take your mind completely off the test or anything school related. To lower stress and anxiety, get your pens, your paper, everything, anything you'll need together in an hour, at least an hour before the test. And then do not study, talk about the upcoming test to anyone. You know, just sit back and do something to listen, like, um, you know, read a book, listen to music, just chillax, do something that, you know, you'd otherwise enjoy to distract yourself. Now, the second tip is related to having good mindset as well. So, you know, there's scientific evidence to back this up. You know, if you like the search this, I'm sure there are many studies done on this uh, on Google Scholar. Get a good night's sleep beforehand and don't pull an all-nighter. So, similar to what I said about being done your studying in advance of the test, if you are pulling an all-nighter to study, you're going to wake up tired. And when you're tired, you're prone to making careless or small errors. So, like, you know, those mistakes that everyone's made, like reversing a negative sign or forgetting, like, um, you know, to flip the equation uh, in thermodynamics, things like that. Mistakes that are otherwise avoidable. Also having a healthy diet and eating good food before the test, you know, drinking enough water, those are also important. You need energy to write a test. You know, your mind takes up energy as well. It's not just your muscles. So make sure to have a good breakfast for the day of the test. And, you know, eat like a banana or something like a chocolate bar or something right before the test. So you have enough energy just to first, you know, stay within limits, you know, keep it cool with the coffee, uh, maybe don't be like her. So before you even start the test, you should like your, you should ask your teacher how much time you have for the test. Some teachers give a lot of time, say two hours, and some teachers give, say, 
maybe an hour for a 50 mark test. So you should kind of know the ratio of how many marks the test is going to be to how many minutes you will have to do the test beforehand. So this way you'll be able to properly pace yourself. So when writing a test, make sure you know exactly how much time you have and read through the test in its entirety before you start. So the minute the teacher says you can begin now, you open the test and you read through it from A to Z. You read the instructions and read every single question while simultaneously assessing yourself what questions you feel good about, what questions you aren't so sure about. Um, and you know, while doing this, obviously you want to pace yourself, keep an eye on the clock. This should take maybe 30 seconds to a minute. What happens is that when you read through the entire test, you know, you will either realize you know everything on that test and feel mu that much more confident, again, mindset, or you'll realize which questions you do know and which questions you don't, and the ones to leave for last. And this will help you develop an, sort of an order of how to attempt the questions. So I'll just give a sort of quick example right here from um, something I dug up. So what I'm, let's say this is my test. What am I looking for here? So I start off, you know, this is an integration test I know, so it's calculus. Um, so let's start off. So we have our six mark question first. This is, gonna, this is probably going to take a lot of time. Uh, we know that. This is a three mark question, one for each thing that you have to find. So you can kind of see the mark allocation. Uh, I feel confident about this. It's just uh, simple integration. Um, what else? Total 13 marks. This is just simple computation. I can probably do this first. This is easy. I feel good about this. Um, I know, again, another simple integration. I feel good about this too. More simple computation. Um, hmm. This one. This is six marks, but I don't feel so great about this one. So maybe this is one I should leave for last. Now, these are all pretty high value questions, so I'm going to have to split my time up accordingly. If I have one hour, I should spend approximately, this is 13 marks, so maybe 15 or so minutes for this, um, 15 or so minutes for this, 15 or so minutes for uh, this, and then I can, I can attempt this one for last. I feel good about everything else. So that's kind of how you're going through and looking at the test. So I kind of hinted at this earlier, but remember that you are not bound to writing the test in the order that the questions appear. I recommend starting with the questions that you are most confident about right away first and leaving the ones you aren't so good with to the end. And these, like, the questions that you are good with, the questions you aren't good with, these are things that you identify the first thing, the first, that's the first thing you do when you read through the test. That's what you're looking for. That's what I just said. I looked for, you know, which questions do I feel good about, which questions do I not feel good about. And, you know, that's how I start. You make kind of like a plan of attack for the test. You want to optimize to have the most chance of getting the most marks in the shortest amount of time possible. So don't obsess over questions you don't understand unless you've solved like literally all other questions. So for example, say this is my calculus test. So, you know, starting off, I read through all the questions and uh, I, I said I wanted to start with this question because it is just simple calculus computation. So, okay. So when I was first reading through the test, I noticed that, you know, part, this is a multi-part question, but each part is just simple computation. This is five marks. This is two marks. This is three marks, three marks, and this is one mark. So the mark allocation tells me roughly how much, how much time this should take me. So, you know, I see this should take me the least time and this should take me the most time. So, you know, maybe I don't want to start off with a question that's going to take me the most time. This is a complex, like, chain rule. We have chain rule going here. We have the quotient rule. So, yeah, maybe I don't want to start with this. We'll start with the one mark question. So what if this is a simple power, this is like a simple polynomial. So I'll be able to do this in and out in, like, 20 seconds. I'm going to start with this and work my way up in reverse order for this question just to make it easier for myself and have, uh, make, like, pace myself. I don't want to have such that I get stuck on this question and I'm spending all my time on this question and I don't get the free easy marks that is this polynomial, this, uh, what is this is like two chain rules going here, I think. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you're getting, you're, you're using, you're optimizing your time to get the most marks in the least amount of time possible. Also, there is a helpful order of questions that you can follow here. You know, you obviously want to prioritize either the easy or high mark questions the first. So for example, I saw the polynomial. I saw it's going to be the easiest. I can just do it mentally. So I'm going to attempt that question first. Um, there are categories of questions that, you know, you go through. So you, first of all, you want to go through the, like the easy and fast questions. These are the ones that, you know, you know, you can do, you feel confident, you know, sometimes, 
and then after that you want to go go through and do maybe the harder questions the, the questions that you're a bit like iffy about um but this is after you've done all the easy questions and then there are the easy and tedious questions you know the ones that are like maybe doing a third derivative of a quotient rule it's going to get messy right so these are the ones you want to leave to after that you've at least attempted the hard questions because sometimes you start your question and you know it ends up being easier than you originally thought when you were first looking through it so this is going to sound counterintuitive to a lot of people but you know just relax take three deep breaths at half time and just relax for 28 seconds like when you're stressed out you will make the most mistakes i guarantee you I always found that, you know, when I was writing tests, the teacher said things like, you know, you have 30, 30 minutes left or you have 15 minutes left and I would get panicked and just like from the adrenaline that's rushing, I just blank. So whenever that happens to you, just, you know, stop, take a deep breath and remember that you're doing okay. You know, you, you know everything on this test. A teacher cannot test you on something that you don't know. So obviously you, you, you know every single thing that's on this test. You're going to be okay. Just take a deep breath. So I gave a demonstration of this when I was going through my test, but when you're going through your test, you use the number of marks allocated to each question as a gauge of how much work is expected of you. So if the question is worth one mark, the answer is probably very obvious and you can afford to just write the answer down. So for example, uh, let's look at this. Calculate the pressure of the gas. You know, you have everything here. So this is just a plug-in chug question. It's one mark. I see it's one mark, so I know it, it's just a plug and chug. So I put it into the ideal gas equation and that's going to be your answer. Very easy mark. Now, another example, this is a physics question from IV. You know, you have a command term state. So state is a command term. That means you read through the question and you find it's also one mark. So you read through the question and you know, there's something about the question that's very obvious that, you know, you don't have to do no thinking involved. You just have to put down the answer. So state the value of the resultant force on the aircraft when hovering. Resultant force, that's Newton's third law. So if something, let, let me read through this question. So the resultant force is going to be the opposite of the hovercraft. So it says it hovers motionless. So that means if, if, if something hovers, the net force has to be zero. And thus, F net equals zero Newtons. And obviously, this goes both ways. If the question is with five marks, the answer probably requires multiple steps. And your teacher expects five marks worth of work worth of work in order to get full marks. So don't be the person who loses marks on a correct answer just because you know she didn't show her work. Make sure you read the question to see how much work is expected of you as well. So you know, just like in the previous question, we saw the command term state. What does the word state mean? That's what it means. There's something in the question that's very obvious, you just have to find it to answer the question. You know. Now, here's the thing about this. This also works if you can't actually do the question. This works in your favor. If you can't actually do the question, you don't know how to do the question, you can still get part marks or error carried forward marks depending on your teacher. So uh, before you go into the test, you should clarify you know, your teacher's error carried forward or you know, part mark policy. If you have a five mark question that you can't solve, write down as many of the equations and theories relevant to the question uh, instead of leaving it blank and just getting a zero. You know, you can get at least half of the marks from showing your teacher you have some semblance of knowledge about the question, which you do, even if you don't finish it. So if you forgot one intermediate step, but know everything else, you know, make an assumption, you'll get an error grade forward mark. If you do everything afterwards correctly this way, you'll get marks where you don't have otherwise gotten none. So, you know, let's look at this, for example. Um, person may not, must not slide down the wall. So obviously the force that is being exerted by gravity must be equal or yeah must be equal to the friction the um, friction so say I don't know how to do this this is a two mark question you know it should take me um, a modicum of work maybe a few equations and some solving so maybe I can put down the equation of friction I can put down the con the um, some relevant equation something that will get me to you know resemble this I have, I know that gravity is one of the forces acting. I know static friction is one of the other forces acting. So I can maybe write that, say that, you know, gravity and the friction are opposing. And, you know, for the person not sliding down the wall, they must be equal to zero. And I will actually get part marks for that. Maybe not the full two marks. If I don't know how to do this question, if I don't, have, one mark is obviously for the final answer. If I can't get that final answer, I won't get full marks, but I will not get zero marks either. So this works in your favor. So here, I'll give another example from a question that's worth more marks. So let's say, okay, this is a basic integration question, f of x dx equals eight. So I know that this is a definite integral. Uh, 
So let's just assume for a second here that I do not know how to solve this question. I'm clueless. I don't know, you know, what I'm supposed to do with this. And, you know, I have to just carry forward and try and get as many of these six marks out of this question as I can. So, you know, uh, deduce the value of, so they want me to deduce something. So we can see here that I have the same definite integral here, just it's, uh, sorry, the same function here is just multiplied by two. So what I can do here, so I know that a definite integral is, you know, is uh, gonna be equal to f of three minus f of zero since it's put in this format. So two times f of x will be two times f of three, or sorry, uh, two times f of three minus two times f of zero dx. So that way I can, you know, put that down. I, I can tell the teacher that, you know, I, I know how to, I, I have some of a knowledge in how to do integration and, you know, maybe I'll get one of the mark, if not, uh, you know, all of them. And, you know, this is obviously assuming that I don't know how to do this. If you know how to do it, then, you know, just, just do it. But this helps in getting you marks where you otherwise may have blanked or you don't know what to do or the question is very complicated and you would otherwise have gotten none. So instead of getting none, you'll get some. So now when writing tests, you should keep an eye on the clock, take your watch. If you have a watch and you're in person, put it in front of you on the desk. You should have an idea of how much time you should be spending on each question. And this, you, you, you know this from how many marks is assigned to the question. So a question with higher marks will take a longer amount of time. So if you're spending too much time on one question, just leave it and skip it. If you can't figure out one of the questions, just leave it and come back to it later. You know, try to work fast enough that you're finished the tests and checking your work at least five minutes and, you know, ideally maybe 10, 15 minutes before the deadline, before the deadline to hand in the test, depending on how much time you're allotted. So, you know, some tests I'd be finished by half time. So I just redo the questions, redo the entire test, check my work. Uh, you know, I check my work by substituting or graphing, maybe tidying up my solutions, making the test look prettier. In other cases, I'd only have five to 10 minutes left. That's not a lot of time. Uh, and, you know, in this case, I just reread all the questions again, compare them to my final answer to see if I've answered what the question wanted from me properly. If my answer is in the correct form, then I'd use, you know, intuition to get a feel for if my answer was reasonable or not. And then I'd only redo the questions in which I wasn't as confident with, with my answer. And that would, um, that would be how I prioritize checking my work in a time sensitive situation. So, you know, that brings up another important point. So how do you actually check your work? A lot of people, they check their work by just rereading the test. And I'm going to tell you right now, you will never ever catch any mistakes just by rereading your work. That's called passive reading. You're not going to, that's not going to help anything. It's the same as in English where, you know, you won't always catch mistakes in your English paper just by rereading it. You may have to read your paper aloud to catch things, or maybe you have to sleep on it a few days, you know, just like that. Whenever you're doing a test for be it physics or for math or anything, always check your work by using there are many ways so you can use your intuition. So for example, does an answer of x equals 2000, x equals negative 2000 really sound reasonable for a quadratic equation like x to the power of two minus four equals zero? You know, it sounds outlandishly large, right? So that's, if that's, if that's what you got as your answer, you can know that, you know, hmm, maybe something's not right here and I should, uh, I, I need to check my work here. You know, another way is by redoing the question on a scrap piece of paper. So you can redo the question as it is on another piece of paper. And if you get the same answer, that's great. But you know, if there's something conflicting, either you've done something wrong on uh, your, when you did it the second time, or you made a mistake when you did it the first time. So it can kind of alert you to any potential mistakes that you might be making. You can also check your work by substituting or graphing, uh, redoing the questions, your intuition, you know, you can use a check method. So for example, um, Say I'm doing calculus and I did a second, I'm being asked to do a second derivative. I can check my work by, you know, integrating two times. If I get the same answer um, by integrating as I did, uh, or rather as I received in the original question, then I know that I did my second derivative correctly. And yeah, also this is the point in time, 15 minutes before the test where you come back to the harder questions the ones you can get the first time. So now if you're at this point, where you know you have to guess, you don't know, you want to make an informed guess. Uh, you want to make an informed guess on the on the answer because you should know your teacher and know how uh, she or he or he makes their test. You should use whatever background knowledge you have as well to make that guess educated. So 
figure out what it is your teacher wants from you. So you can use various strategies, especially if it's multiple choice, like elimination across all wrong answers, and look for logical connections to make logically inducted. So let's take an example of this question that um, one of my friends had on his test. So what is the pH of a 0.015 magnesium hydroxide solution? Magnesium hydroxide is fully soluble. So um, let's assume I forgot all my stoichiometry. I don't know how to do any pH calculations. So, okay, what, what is my background knowledge here? So I want to figure out what is the pH. So pH is 0 to 14. I know that. 7 is neutral. Seven to four, or 8 to 14 is basic. 0 to 6 is acidic. Okay, um, so that means if it's, ba if it's acidic, it has to be these two. If it's basic, it has to be these two. I have two points, so I know it's going to be somewhat complex. Uh, magnesium hydroxide, fully soluble, so this is a dissolved in a solution. Solutions are usually water. Water is neutral. Um, we have hydroxide here. Hydroxide is basic. Hydroxide, uh, that would mean that, you know, this would be basic, and that means my answer obviously has to be, it can be these two. It has to be these two because these are the only two basic answers here. Now, let's say I forgot my calculations, my stoichiometry, everything. Um, if I were to find the amount of hydroxide in my um, in my solution, I would know how much, or rather, how many, what the percent of hydroxide ions are in my solution. That would I would put that into my power of hydrogen or power of hydroxide logarithm to find out what my pH is. That would be how I solve the question, but I don't know how to calculate the um, how, how much how, how many hydrox hydroxide ions are in the um, are in the solution. So I know that you know pH as is uh, always under 14. So the amount of the power of hydrogen and the power of hydroxide should always add up to 14. So you know I obviously know it's not these two. I know. It has to be one of these, so it's either 12.18 or 12.48. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm left guessing between these two. Now, you know, I'm going to think about what the teacher wants. So I'm going to think about how my teacher might have created this question. So I can see here he has this answer of 1.52, right? So with 1.52, it's the, if you add it to 12.48, it adds up to 14, which is, you know, the pH skill. pH skill is out of 14. So, you know, maybe he put this in as a trick answer. To, you know, if someone put in the uh, amount of hydroxide into the power of uh, hydroxide logarithm and uh, he forgot to convert it back to pH and not pOH. So maybe this was a trick. Maybe this was a trick answer. So I made this educated guess here. And that way uh, I can know that it can't be this because this is not at these two do not add up to 14. This is what would add up to 14. So I can therefore deduce that this might be the answer if, you know, I forgot my uh, stoichiometry here. So that was pretty complex and took a lot of time, but you know, if you've reached a point in time where you know I, you can't figure out the question at all, or you've just run out of time having exhausted all of the other problem solving techniques, like trying to reverse engineer the problem, uh, playing around with the given info to see where it takes you. Sometimes, you know, you just dump whatever you get in the question into equations and you know, you get somewhere and eventually you'll get to the right answer. Um, and you know, this might also happen when you're under a lot of stress and you can't think straight. Uh, that's what adrenaline does. Uh, that's happened to me on tests that I wasn't able to finish in time. So, you know, th this is a point where you want to take the information that's given in the test and try to write down as many relevant equations as you, I can with the given info, you know, write some statements and such as far as I can go with the question before getting stuck. Or I look at the number of marks and make a guess as to what steps are needed of me and do as much as I can. So the key is that you want to have something relevant to the question there in order for you to get as many part marks to the question as you can, opposed to having your, your um, paper be blank. You know, you don't want your paper to be blank because uh, even if your mind is blank, if your mind is blank, you don't want your paper to be blank because if your paper is blank, your score for that question is also going to be blank. So, you know, pick up as many marks as you can and make sure that you don't find yourself in such a situation again in the next test. So these are my top 10 tips for doing well on a test. You know, if you consistently apply these to all of your tests, you'll become that much better of a test taker and a better student overall. So consistently practicing these strategies work wonders on most tests. So I really hope this is helpful. Uh, I didn't talk at all about how to actually prepare a study for a test and you know since that's another topic 
um, on its own entirely. So if this video is helpful and you'd like to hear my advice on how to study for a test, let me know in the comment section um, or just by liking the video and I'll be sure to make a similar video. Have a great night.